So when we start talking about spring force, the other conservative force we are talking about in this semester, what you will quickly realize is that, well, spring force is not constant. So when I hang this spring here, the, so the amount of spring force that's being applied right now versus the amount of spring force that's there right now and the amount of spring force that's there right now. Are those constant? Like for those three scenarios, spring force is different, right? Let me draw a figure to help you visualize. So at this very top position, where I hung zero mass here, how much spring force would you say there is? Zero, zero right? So spring force is zero. Let me hang a 10 gram, I think this is a 10 gram. No, let me tell, hang a 100 gram mass. So at this position where the spring is, uh, what do you think the, um, what's the direction of a spring force? Upward, right? So there's a, so imagine drawing a free body diagram of this mass here. There's downward force, there's gravity pulling it down, but it's not accelerating downward because there's a, another force pulling it up, that's the spring force. There's the spring force pulling it up. And in fact, based on this diagram, I can say they must be equal in magnitude. So the spring force is upward, and if this is 100 grams, then spring force is approximately one newtons. Good. Let me hang another 200 grams so that now this spring is stretched down to about here. At this position, the, so spring force is still upward, right? What's the magnitude of spring force? I'm hanging 300 gram masses here with a downward weight of uh, three newtons. So upward force of three newtons, right? So here I have upward spring force of approximately three newtons. So this is what I mean. Um, spring force, it, it's a function of position. It depends on how far you have stretched it. If you didn't stretch it at all, then the spring force is zero. And depending on how much force it's uh, giving, it stretches different amount. And that's really why I was using, sorry. That's uh, really why I was using spring to illustrate whenever I was applying a force that I wanted to show that I was applying a force. So let's say uh, we want to come up with an actual expression for spring force. Uh, any guesses what that expression should be? So let's say I want to write down an actual equation for spring force. And to say a spring force as a vector quantity is equal to something. I um, think I have some sense that it's going to depend on displacement, because that's what you saw here, right? Depends on how far you displayed it from, displaced it from where it started off from. Um, anything else it seems to depend on? Oh, so you know, with the mass, so mass is what I'm using to apply a known amount of force. So I could just uh, stretch a spring this way, and spring is applying a force on my finger. It's just harder for you to see that the force that the spring is applying is three newtons here. So spring force doesn't depend on mass, because I could be doing other things that causes the spring to stretch. Here, right now, I'm just using the mass, using it to cause it to stretch. That's the displacement here. Uh, by displacement, I mean displacement of this point here. So anything else it seems to depend on? Right now, no, right? Now, so maybe I want to say this, that the spring force is equal to, well, let me actually move this over, spring force is equal to um, delta x as the displacement. There are actually two problems with writing down this, which is I'm leaving room here to correct it. Uh, and can someone tell me what some of those two problems are with uh, trying to write down something that looks like this? 
it doesn't have a spring constant. So if you have seen spring force in another physics class before, then that's what you're realizing, that there's no spring constant. Let me tell you what the, the problem that spring constant is fixing. So the un, it's a unit. The unit on the left-hand side, the unit here is Newton. I'm talking about force, right? Or write it out in terms of a basic SI unit. The unit on the left-hand side are kilogram times meter per second squared, mass times acceleration. Unit on the right-hand side right now, it's just the meters. And a Newton cannot equal however many meters. It's two different quantities. On the, the, I want the right-hand side, when, with everything included, to be in Newtons. So that's where I introduce a constant. I say, there must be a constant here, call it K. And this constant must have correct units to turn this meter into Newton. So I guess the, the constant here must be Newton per meter. <laughs> because that's what it should work out to be. Or if you write it out like I did on the left-hand side, then it'll be kilogram meter per second squared divided by meter, so it'll be kilogram per second squared. And in homework questions and different questions, you will see spring constant given in these two different units, either Newton per meter or kilogram per second squared. Think of this, my, was this one of your exam questions? Exam one, yeah, yeah. So you know, it was on your exam one because you could have figured this out based on unit alone. Yeah. Okay, so that's one problem fixed. There's one more problem. Yeah, you, Stephen, you're looking at the directions, right? So when I pull this spring downward, am I applying? Is the displacement downward or upward? Downward. Is the spring force downward or upward? Upward, which means, all right, I have to indicate somewhere here that these two are in opposite directions. So I need to have a minus sign here. So this is uh, uh, something that you might have seen in other physics classes before, or you know, other classes before. If you remember the name Hooke's Law, this is what it is. Because a guy named Robert Hooke, um, in the, who lived in the same time as Newton, uh, was the guy who came up with this. But uh, you know, that's, that's Hooke's law. <laughs> so this is the spring force. And what this expression is telling you is that spring force is it's not a constant. It's a force that depends on position. And what we want to say is that somehow even this is still predictable enough to be, it's still predictable enough to be considered conservative force. So, you know, in what sense is this predictable? Let me show you a little illustration. Um, let's say uh, I take this mass and I pull it down. Apply more force than gravity so that it gets pulled down. So um, normally there would be, um, let's see. Okay, or let me do it this way. I'm going to start, uh, start it out with up here, right? And if there wasn't a spring force, when I let go, it would accelerate downward, right? Gain kinetic energy. But when there's a spring force, when I let go, this is what you see happen. It slows down. So that, um, so that after it moves some distance, at this point here, it comes to a complete stop. So that's what happens. So you know, spring force does negative work. When I lift to this and let go, as it moves downward, the spring force is um, spring force is opposing it falling down, and it's slowing it down until it comes to a stop here. So spring force has done negative work. It's taken out kinetic energy, and in fact, it has taken out some of the gravitational potential energy also. And when we are calling spring force um, conservative force, what I what we are trying to get at is that. Um, it's still somehow predictable. In what sense is it predictable? It, you see it returning the mass back, right? So you know, after it has come to a stop here, it doesn't remain stopped there, it moves back. And the reason it moves back is that at this position, spring force is still acts upward. So that after it's come to a stop, there is an upward spring force which is pulling it up which is accelerating it up. At this position, there's also upward spring forces still. So 
when you look at spring force, look at it in detail, it depends only on position. It doesn't depend on anything else. And that's what makes the spring force predictable. So I want to now make the uh, make this statement more precise, where I said, you know, conservative force is predictable. Predictable in what sense? Well, it's predictable in this sense. And this is the description of conservative force you would find in the textbook. It's predictable in the sense that it, it is a function. It is a function only of position. So that when, uh, when the mass is at a particular position, you don't have to know anything else to know what the spring force is. Whether it's moving downward, upward, whether it's moving or not, the amount of spring force only depends on position. And that was actually true with the gravity too. And you know, we'll see the universal gravitation a few weeks from now. But gravity, it's technically function only of position. It just happened to be a constant function. So it actually didn't depend on position, the way you're looking at it. And every one of these forces that are non-conservative force, it's a function of something other than position. Friction, what is a function of other than position? Especially, um, well, let's think about kinetic friction. Like, what is a function of other than position that we don't consider friction to be a conservative force? What else does it depend on? So, okay, it depends on normal force, but you know, when you look at this situation here, you would say, all right, the block is here, you know, friction, um, so friction, and wait, how are this gravity, mg, thank you, uh, normal force, and so as this moves back and forth, does normal force change? No, so the fact that friction, kinetic friction is, you know, coefficient times normal force, in, at least in this example, normal force doesn't change, so you don't have to worry about friction being a function of normal force. But you still see a demonstration that friction is a non-conservative force. I mean, if a friction is constant, like this formula would have you believe, then shouldn't friction be as conservative as gravity? So what's the, there's one more quantity that friction does depend on that's easy to miss. Watch me push this block back and forth. Watch me push it to the right, push it to the left. Is friction the same in both cases? The magnitude might be the same. I mean, friction is a vector quantity. Is it the same in both cases? No, how is it different? Somebody said no. Maggie? The direction is different. When, I, when it goes from left to right, friction is acting to left. When it goes right to left, friction is acting to right. So friction is a function of not just normal force, it's a function of also, um, I guess, direction, or one way to mathematically say it is the velocity vector oops, divided by the, its magnitude. So it does depend on what the direction of velocity is. That's why friction is not a conservative force. What about tension and normal force? In fact, do we even have a formula for tension and normal force? We don't. Uh, tension and normal force are one of those forces that we find them out because uh, they satisfy a particular constraint. It either, um, so you know, tension force, its entire role is that this mass is at a fixed distance from this. And it's whatever force it is necessary for that to be true. So tension and normal force do not have a, so it can be function of many different things. That's why they are non-conservative. Now, having said that, a lot of situations where you have tension force like here, they end up not doing any work. So here, tension force acts radially from this, uh, to this point, right? Displacement is in a direction that's tangential direction, perpendicular to this. So according to this definition of work, tension force is not doing any work in this setup. That's why you have this intuition for where there's tension force. You don't have to worry about energy being changed. And that's true in many of the cases. But I want you to start out from the correct place, that these are not uh, conservative forces. I can always come up with a situation where there is a tension force that's, doing, that's changing energy. There is a normal force that's changing energy. Here's another way to put it. 
every conservative force you can associate with the potential energy. Tension force and normal force, there's no such thing as a potential energy that's associated with these two. And apply the force, it's not conservative for a very simple reason. It kind of depends on um, what I want to do. So, you know, when this kin uh, block is here, and if I don't want to apply any force, then, you know, it does, its energy doesn't change. The moment I decide I want to push it, its energy changes. So apply the force depends on the whim of whoever's applying the force. That's why, sort of, by default, it's not a conservative force. So, um, so you know, these are the only two conservative forces you will see in this class. But I want you to be on the lookout for more, especially in the future physics classes. When you take physics 4B, you will see that electric force is a conservative force. Magnetic force, surprisingly, is actually a conservative force. And in fact, at a fundamental level, every single force is a kind of conservative force, which is why uh, what we said on Tuesday holds, that total energy is always conserved. You just have to account for all the different forms of energy. But for the purpose of this class, we are keeping to simple ones, gravity and spring force. Any other force you see is not conservative. And um, the question you should ask is, OK, is that non-conservative force doing any work? If it's not doing any work, then you can say, oh, my energy will be conserved. And that will be one tool you will use in problem solving um, starting, I guess, next week. Yeah. Questions, comments? 